Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we've got another one of our ship comparison videos. This time, we're going to compare the uh, final battleship ever built, the British battleship Vanguard, to the Iowa class. There are very few battleships which can actually compare to the Iowas. Uh, the, the Iowas were some of the last and greatest battleships ever built, and uh, really it's only a couple of the battleships in that final generation that, that can even compare. And uh, not to spoil anything, Vanguard is one of the few that does favorably compare in, in a lot of aspects to her American counterparts. Well, it's not really planned initially. The Royal Navy was building the King George V class battleships in the 35,000 ton range as their Washington Naval Treaty battleships. Uh, and they ended up building five of those ships after um, they saw that war was coming and it would be quicker to just build repeats of that than to try and uh, come up with a new design. And that said, they did have a new design for a roughly 40,000 ton 16-inch armed uh, battleship, which would have been called the Lion class, and uh, four of those battleships were projected, and two of them were even laid down before the start of World War II. Um, however, the uh, wartime requirements calls those ships to not ever be completed. And we're going to do a separate video talking about the Lions later on. Um, but the Lions 16-inch guns, which was a, a brand new uh, turret and barrel design for the Royal Navy, they had 16-inch guns on Nelson and Rodney, but uh, those mountings had been finicky. Uh, they, they tried to use a lot of lightweight aluminums and stuff to bring them in under the, the weight requirements of the Washington Naval Treaty. So they wanted to develop a whole new system, and that was going to take time. So, uh, in 1940, they started to look at uh, the wars going on. We've got uh, three ships in our battlecruiser squadron, Repulse, Renown, and Oud. Uh, and the battlecruiser squadron is less a force of battlecruisers, more just the fast wing of the home fleet. Uh, and so they looked at outfitting it as a full squadron with a fourth ship. Uh, and they happened to have extra 15-inch guns laying around from the World War I era uh, battle cruisers, or some people call them large light cruisers, Courageous and Glorious. Uh, these ships were designed to be fast and lightly armored, but they each only had two twin turrets, one forward and one aft. Uh, and uh, so they were converted into aircraft carriers during the interwar years, but their gun turrets were saved. And the, uh, the British 15-inch turret was maybe the best weapon system in the world during World War II. Uh, and it still served with distinction, uh, excuse me, in World War I, and it served with distinction into World War II on, on a number of the British battleships. So the idea was uh, the British could build a fast battleship to add to their battle squadron uh, armed with these older guns, and that ship would, one, uh, help them keep up with Germany and Japan, who each had large naval programs going on at this time, although those programs wouldn't be completed. Uh, and uh, it would have done this quickly, even with wartime measures going on. So, in 1940, Churchill was still First Lord of the Admiralty, and he supported this plan. So they drew up some plan, some designs, and they laid the ship down. Uh, and they even took priority away from some merchant ships and uh, some light cruisers in order to try and accelerate this process. And the idea was that, that this ship could probably be finished by uh, maybe 1943, possibly 1944. Uh, now, in the end, the British 
lost HMS Prince of Wales, a King George V class battleship, in December of uh, 41. They lost HMS Hood in May of 41. And they lost HMS Repulse in December of 41, along with Prince of Wales. So uh, basically, that was two thirds of their fast force and one of their modern battleships uh, being sunk pretty early in the construction of Vanguard. Uh, so with these lessons in mind, Vanguard got a redesign. Uh, so they wanted to upgrade the torpedo defenses from Prince of Wales. They wanted to upgrade the uh, powder magazines from Hood and uh, well, Repulse was an old enough design that uh, there wasn't much to upgrade from there. But uh, now, without a rush to outfit a full battlecruiser squadron, they, they delayed progress to uh, make some redesigns. Uh, and then throughout the war, other uh, priorities came up. Aircraft carriers were more important. Escort ships were more important. Merchant ships were more important. And, and so as it turned out in the end, Vanguard wasn't commissioned until the 12th of May of 1946. Uh, she wasn't launched until 1944, November of 44. So by that point, uh, had they just continued with the original design and priorities, uh, she could have already been in service. There was no need for her. Axis battleships had been contained uh, really from 1943 on. Uh, Japanese battleships would come out in force at Leyte Gulf in October of 44, uh, but the British hadn't shifted to the Pacific at that point in any force, and uh, the Americans had more than enough battleships to counter the Japanese if they were in the right place. Um, but the, the need for Vanguard just wasn't there at that time. So uh, let's look at her design. Her design actually ends up being very, very similar to the Iowas. Uh, she was designed to displace about 45,000 tons, and she ended up displacing a little over uh, 50,000 tons. So she, she was slightly smaller than the Iowas, but not by much. Uh, she, she was also pretty comparable in size and weight to Bismarck, uh, for, which was uh, a little bit larger, the largest European battleship ever built. Uh, she was 814 feet long, so about uh, 70 feet, 75 feet uh, shorter than in Iowa. She was 108 feet wide, same same beam, and she drew 36 feet of water, and Iowa draws 38 feet of water. So, so this ship is very, very similar in, in size. An interesting difference, uh, Vanguard was only designed to make 30 knots. She was even able to exceed this uh, and hit about 31 and a half knots on builder's trials. She did this with only 130,000 shaft horsepower. The Iowas, in order to touch 33 knots, had 212,000 shaft horsepower. So uh, a massively larger uh, propulsive plant, or not larger as it turns out, a massively more powerful propulsive plant. Vanguard, just like the Iowas, had eight boilers. Uh, just like the Iowas, she had them in four boiler rooms. And just like the Iowas, she had them alternating boiler room, engine room, boiler room, engine room, uh, all the way through the plant. She had four propellers, uh, same deal. So um, the, the major difference was Vanguard was heating her boiler feed water to about 700 degrees and uh, about 350 pounds of pressure. The Iowa's steam was at 600 pounds of pressure and had been heated to about 850 degrees. So uh, the, the Iowa's were getting more out of their steam to get a higher horsepower. Uh, but even though their horsepower was massively higher, their speed was uh, really only three knots faster at best. Uh, the Iowas do have a much greater range. Vanguard's range was 800, excuse me, 8,750 nautical miles, so a little bit more than earlier battleships. In fact, after the hunt for the Bismarck, where uh, 
Rodney and uh, King George V were really low on fuel and other British ships had had to drop out of the pursuit, they uh, increased her oil bunkerage in order to uh, try and prevent something like that from happening again. Uh, British warships didn't have the same range as American warships because the Royal Navy had bases all over the world. Uh, the United States had uh, significantly longer range, ne nearly twice as long, with uh, 15,000 nautical mile range uh, for their ships because they could operate in the wide expanse of the Pacific where there weren't really forward bases to support the fleet uh, prior to the war when the ships were designed. Uh, in terms of armor plating, Vanguard's armor was pretty similar to the preceding King George V class, just like Iowa's armor was similar to the preceding South Dakota class. Uh, the belt was a maximum of 14 inches, which is thicker than the Iowa's, uh, a little bit th thinner than the King George's. When they added additional torpedo defense, they had to take, uh, save weight elsewhere. So, a 14 inch thick belt at its maximum, a little bit thicker than the Iowa's. Uh, it could stop a 15 inch shell at some ranges. Uh, I, I would say that this system of armor was probably uh, less effective, not effective at uh, stopping the German 15 inch guns that they might have encountered on Bismarck or Tirpitz. Uh, and Certainly in a comparison against the Iowa's, it wouldn't stop a super heavy 16 inch shell at most ranges. Uh, for a deck, she had a six inch deck, very comparable to the Iowa's. Uh, on her turrets, they actually rehabbed the uh, 15 inch turrets and uh, I spent over three million pounds on that, which ended up being about a quarter of the ship's total cost to build. Uh, and, and part of that was to put new armor on. So the turrets had a maximum armor thickness of 13 inches, uh, which again, it's pretty good against 15 inch guns. It, it won't stop much larger than that. Um, the, the Iowa's had 17 inches plus some additional layers for their thickest turret armor. Interestingly, the conning tower was only three inches thick at its maximum. The Iowa's have a 17.3 inch conning tower. The British were the first to adopt the idea of, uh, hey, the conning tower is a lot of weight, very high in the ship. It's very unlikely it's going to be hit. And because it's a small armored box, uh, when it gets hit by a shell, that shell might not punch through, but there's still going to be enough pressure and shockwave and stuff that the people on the inside aren't going to be much good anymore after that. Um, so let's just get rid of that. So they had a three inch basically splinter protection conning tower. Um, and it's interesting, that's one of the things later on in the Iowa's career uh, that they looked at replacing. So uh, check out the, this video linked below in uh, about things that the Navy doesn't like about the Iowa class battleships. Uh, a lot of the stuff you see here was corrected on Vanguard or was in response to what they saw on Vanguard, a contemporary battleship of similar size. Uh, so with the subsequent Iowa class battleships, Illinois and Kentucky, it was seriously considered deleting the armored conning tower because it wasn't much use. Uh, earlier American battleships, which had been refit, like uh, Tennessee, California, and West Virginia, had their armored conning tower deleted in a similar fashion. So, uh, pretty interesting that, that the British were spearheading this and that the, the Americans were getting uh, some of their uh, information from the British. Uh, in terms of gunnery, this is where Vanguard uh, kind of falls flat in comparison to the Iowa's. Her armor holds up pretty well. Her speed uh, holds up pretty well. Her firepower fall, falls short. These are the best weapons of World War I, perhaps, but uh, the eight 15-inch guns that she was armed with 
uh, even being refit to have an elevation of 30 degrees were not uh, they, they don't compare favorably to, to modern 16 inch guns uh, so you, you, you take these 15 inch guns and match them against Yamato's 18s or America uh, the Iowa's 16s uh, or even the uh, smaller 16-inch 45 caliber guns of earlier American battleships, and uh, they just don't stack up well. Against ships they were going to encounter in Europe, the Italian Latorios, the French Reichelus, the uh, German Bismarcks, they're pretty good in terms of shell weight and everything else, uh, with being an older mount and only being refit to elevate to 30 degrees, they have a fairly short range. Uh, so they're going to be massively outranged by German, Italian, French, uh, or American or Japanese guns. Uh, on paper, this looks bad. In practice, no shell was ever fired from a moving target at another moving target uh, and hit at a range of greater than 13 miles. The German battleship Scharnhorst was able to hit a uh, British aircraft carrier 13 miles with an 11-inch shell, and the British battleship War Spite was able to hit an Italian ship with a 15-inch gun, uh, very similar to Vanguard's, at 13 miles. Uh, in theory, had these ships operated against enemy battleships, the range could well have been in excess of, 30 mi of, of 13 miles, and shell hits could be landed on her by enemy ships before she could start shooting. Uh, but again, in practice, this never happened. She was armed with 16 5.25-inch guns, and this was her dual-purpose secondary battery. Uh, this fired an 80-pound projectile, compared to the Americans, which used a 5-inch gun with a with 38 calibers. The uh, 5.25 was a 50 caliber weapon. Uh, in the older King George V class, this gun was really inferior. Uh, it, was, it had some good penetrating power against surface ships, but it was an inferior anti-aircraft gun. On Vanguard, these mountings were uh, able to be controlled directly from the gun director, and they were automatic. So uh, they theoretically had a pretty high rate of fire, much higher than the manually operated ones uh, on older ships where, you, where you've got to lift that 80 pound projectile into the gun several times per minute. Uh, so the, the automatic rate of fire of these guns even matched the American five inch 38 which only was using a 55 pound shell that, that could be relatively easily manually loaded. Uh, there were only 16 of them compared to the 20 on the Iowas. Uh, so again, against surface targets, the, uh, the Vanguard probably had the advantage. Against aerial targets, the Iowas had a slight advantage. Uh, this gun, as it was on Vanguard, was vastly superior to anything the Japanese, Germans, or Italians fielded in an anti-aircraft or dual-purpose role. So, again, against likely peer competitors, it was pretty good. She was armed with 73 40mm guns, uh, and these guns also had their own directors similar to uh, the Iowa class. Uh, the Iowas had 80 40mm guns. Uh, with the exception of Iowa herself, who only had 76. So Vanguard comes close, uh, and in wartime she may well have carried more mountings than she actually did. So I, I'd call the uh, the anti-aircraft battery a wash between the two ships. She was designed to carry 20 millimeter guns, but was never outfitted with any. Uh, the Iowa started out with 20 millimeter guns, and in 1950 had them removed. So. Uh, Vanguard likely didn't lose anything by not having hers attached, uh, and, and they again, in, in wartime, they could have easily been added back on. So, I still consider that a wash. Um, uh, 
so that's the, the basic outfitting of the ship. In terms of the hull, Vanguard had what's called a transom stern, and she was the only battleship ever completed with one. It means instead of like the Iowas or other battleships where the stern comes back and is rounded, uh, Vanguard's stern was just flat. Uh, and this was really good for steel ships for hydrodynamic efficiency. Uh, overly long history lesson, sailing ships started off with flat sterns. And uh, this was just a simple way to build them, and it was a weak point in their design. It was less effective at supporting the deck overhead, uh, couldn't mount many guns back aft, and if an enemy ship fired uh, into your stern, you didn't really have any protection. It just shots just went the full length of the ship. Uh, by the mid 1800s, uh, the squared off stern had been replaced with an elliptical stern. And this round stern uh, was able to support more weight. Uh, so it was able to better support the deck. It provided angles that would cause enemy projectiles to bounce off potentially, and it was able to support more weight of guns. So some of the first pivot guns were able to be mounted on the stern, and these, these are the predecessors to turreted guns in that rather than having multiple guns along the back of the ship facing at different angles, you have one gun there that can pivot on rails from one side to the other. Uh, so this round stern is basically maintained through early steel-hauled construction all the way up through World War II. Uh, by World War II, many smaller ships uh, have started to get a squared off stern and it's found to be much more hydrodynamically efficient because the water, which is being cut by the bow and then running across the whole length of the ship, expects to continue to go uh, all the way to a point with the stern. When you cut that stern off, the water goes around, uh, and then all of a sudden, the end of the ship happens before the water thinks it will, so rather than sliding through like this, it slides through and actually pushes forward a little bit and gives the ship a little bit more uh, efficiency. So again, Vanguard was the first and only battleship built like this, although the Lions had been designed like this and some earlier uh, British designs featured this as well, such as N3 and G3. Uh, nowadays, practically every warship is built like this. Uh, American Arleigh Burke class destroyers still under construction do that. Uh, American supercarriers like the Gerald R. Ford or the Nimitz class all have this. Uh, it's real great because it gives helicopter landing pads that are nice and squared off for the destroyers. Uh, for the Gator freighters, it gives a nice big back uh, door area for a well deck. Um, and with steel, you're not worried about the structural support so much as you were with wood. You, you, you can uh, accommodate for that. So that's the stern of the ship, pretty effective. The bow of Vanguard was also very effective. With the King George V's, and earlier battleships for that matter, uh, and even early drafts of Vanguard, the British, for some reason, wanted their A turret, their forwardmost turret, to be able to fire at zero degrees elevation over the bow, which meant that the bow had to be more or less flushed. It couldn't have a curve up, which meant that their ships were gonna ship a lot of water over the bow. They were gonna be wet. Um, This is especially exacerbated in the North Sea, around the, the British Islands, where it's pretty stormy and, and wavy, so you do tend to get a lot of waves. Uh, and so during World War II, you start to see the ranges are increasing, and at these increased range, it's likely that the ships will be able to choose what angle they're gonna be on when they're facing an enemy. So they probably aren't gonna be at point blank range head on to an enemy warship. Uh, so you start to see German ships get a really raked bow. You start to see uh, Japanese ships get a really flared bow. Uh, American ships like the Iowas get a really angled bow to be able to shed water. Uh, 
So like I said, early designs of Vanguard still maintained like the King George V's that they could fire forward over the bow. But by the time she was built, they had decided, uh, yes, they could flare, flare the bow out and they could angle it up. And this made Vanguard a tremendously good sea boat, uh, especially when you compare it to the Iowas. The Iowas have this real narrow forward hull form, which exists to help make the ships as hydrodynamically efficient as possible so that they can be fast moving through the water. Uh, Vanguard is designed less with hydrodynamic efficiency in mind and more uh, with sea keeping in mind. So she will roll less, and this means that she can fire her guns more effectively in heavier seas. Um, so if Vanguard had have been going for the same speed as Iowa, she would have been longer, probably. And they could have done it with the weight that they had. Uh, after looking at the Iowas, or excuse me, after looking at the Vanguards, after looking at HMS Vanguard, the U.S. Navy determined that if they were to cut off the forward 75 feet of the Iowas and put on a Vanguard-style bow, they would only lose three quarters of a knot of speed, which essentially takes them from 33 knots to 32 and some change, uh, and they would be just as effective as sea boats as Vanguard. That would have been a pretty reasonable trade-off, in my opinion. Uh, it was never done to the Iowas. By that point, the four that were built were already built. Uh, Illinois and Kentucky were never completed. And uh, a number of, uh, at least one or two suggestions came up during their design process to cut off a couple of feet from the bow and uh, widen them. It also means that uh, not narrowing as much as they do, there could be more torpedo defense around turret one, which is a real, a real weak point in the underwater protection of the Iowas. Uh, so again, if you look at the uh, video in the description below about uh, things the Navy didn't like about Iowa-class battleships, the, the length of the bow comes up. Uh, and at high speeds and in uh, heavy weather, the bow does vibrate a lot. The, the forward armored bulkhead is just forward of turret number uh, one, and the more lightly built steel ahead of that, especially because it's getting real narrow, uh, does tend to, to uh, vibrate. This was really exacerbated in 1953. Iowa and Vanguard both operated together in a NATO exercise called Operation Mariner. Uh, and this exercise was happening up in the North Sea, and it happened to happen during a hurricane. So the hurricane prevented a lot of the exercise from going on, but it did force Vanguard and Iowa, uh, along with carriers and smaller ships, to operate in extremely heavy seas. And the result was that uh, the Iowas rolled significantly more than Vanguard, making them uh, far less effective gun boats in this kind of weather, uh, and the Iowas had to slow down in order to not damage their bows going through the waves. Uh, and Vanguard was the best sea-keeping vessel in the entire operation. So uh, American carriers, British carriers, all the destroyers and cruisers, of course, and Iowa all had to slow down, and Vanguard could continue to operate. Uh, she did take damage. There were boats that were destroyed. There, there were things that happened. This stuff happens in hurricanes. Uh, Iowa's and other ships took damage. But um, really, really good rough weather capabilities on these ships. And, and that is something to be envied. Um, not being able to fire your guns in weather like that. Odds are, if you're having that kind of trouble, you're not going to run into an enemy ship and get into a gunfight. But... Uh, in terms of crew comfort, only rolling 20 or 30 degrees in a heavy, extremely heavy storm like that, which uh, was said to have caused the Iowa to roll as far as 50 or more degrees, uh, that's that, that's something uh, that's worth emulating. 
ultimately, uh, Vanguard, like I said, she was the last battleship ever built. She had a relatively short career. Uh, she was used essentially as the royal yacht to take King George and the royal family, uh, King George VI and the royal family to South Africa, the first royal visit there by a sitting king. She was the first ship that uh, Queen Elizabeth II ever christened also, um, that's unrelated. So shortly after being built, they went in and they retrofitted Vanguard, uh, they gutted the Admiral's quarters and set it up for the royal family instead, and they removed uh, the 40 millimeter guns from on top of B turret and replaced it with a, a viewing platform. Uh, and so Vanguard was used as a royal yacht there for the South Africa trip. She came back. Uh, she was refit again to be to serve as the flagship, and basically wherever she was assigned, the Mediterranean, the home fleet, the reserve fleet, she was the largest vessel, and she served as the flagship. Uh, on one occasion, she served as the flagship of uh, Philip Vian, was a Sir Philip Vian, the admiral, who was a pretty famous British naval figure from World War II and just after. Uh, served as flagship wherever she went, basically uh, went in and out of refits every couple of years. They would uh, update her to take on the royal family and then update her again to be a flagship and go back and forth with this. Uh, King George VI failing health prevented him from using uh, Vanguard as a royal yacht again. But a number of trips were planned and the ship was getting ready for them before they were canceled. Uh, she went in for a refit in 1955 uh, and she was going to be used to counter the, the large Soviet cruisers, the Svedlov class that were uh, around at that time. And then Churchill left power and the uh, it was decided to just keep two cruisers for much cheaper than continuing to operate Vanguard. So Vanguard became the flagship of the reserve fleet for five years. And then in 1960, she was sold to be scrapped. Uh, and while she was being towed out of the basin, she broke free and it took a couple hours to, and five tugboats to get her back under control. Uh, but she was finally taken to the scrapper and by 1962, she was gone. Um, she was built with pre-nuclear steel, so uh, when she was scrapped, some of her armor plating was saved for medical equipment that was used in the UK. Otherwise, I'm not sure what happened to the, the other bits of her. Turned into razor blades, as they say. Uh, so, that's it for HMS Vanguard. Final analysis. Uh, she really falls below the Iowa's in firepower. Uh, in armor, she's pretty comparable. In uh, speed, she falls a little bit below, but that is in order to give her better sea keeping, which is pretty good. So all in all, I prefer the Iowa's over the Vanguard's, and I think in a fight, one Iowa versus one Vanguard, uh, the Iowa's with their superior gun range, uh, and heavier shells would be able to defeat the Vanguard's armor uh, and probably do significant damage before Vanguard can land hits on the Iowa's. Uh, Iowa's armor might be able to stop the 15-inch shell and uh, Vanguard's armor just really can't stop Iowa's. But uh, pretty effective ship otherwise. I would take Vanguard over any other European battleship uh, that were ever built. Thanks for watching. If you guys have any questions or comments about Vanguard, leave them in the uh, comment section down below. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. If there's a ship you would like to see compared, let us know in the comment section. Uh, if you would like to support our YouTube channel and the museum here, Check the link in the description below. It's got some other videos that are related to this you can watch, and uh, it's got a link to a GoFundMe campaign that we're using to raise money to support this channel. Uh, I appreciate any donation you can make.
Also, we are committed to putting out multiple pieces of content every week. So remember to like, share, and subscribe so you get notified when we're putting out new videos. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.